The Bible Treasury, New Series. N7. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 27, Article 34, 1908 and 1909. Part 32 of 46. Studies in the Gospel of Mark. By W. J. Hawking. 32. John's Rebuke of Herod's Sin. And King Herod heard thereof, for his name had become known, and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore do these powers work in him. But others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet, even as one of the prophets. But Herod, when he heard thereof, said, John, whom I beheaded, he is risen. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. And Herodias set herself against him, and desired to kill him, and she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous man and a holy, and kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was much perplexed and he heard him gladly, Mark 6 verses 14 to 20, Revised Version. See Notes. Notes. 1. Public, J.N.D., Famous, T.S.G. 2. Works of power are wrought by him, J.N.D., The mighty powers do work in him, M.C.C., The powers were busy in him, T.S.G. 3. Kept it in her mind against him, J.N.D., Had a spite against him, M.C.C., Bear him spite, T.S.G. 4. Was regardful of him, T.S.G. 5. Did many things, J.N.D., T.S.G. End of Notes. The activities of the Lord himself and the separate testimonies of his apostles at this period reached the ears of King Herod. The name of Jehovah's servant was becoming famous through his own mighty works, and now through the labors of his servants. Herod did not know Jesus of Nazareth, but his memory was full of John the Baptist, for he had but recently pronounced the cruel sentence of his execution. And when tidings came of one who was working the works of God in Galilee, he could only think of the righteous and holy prophet who had been as the mouth of God to him. But how were these miracles of Jesus Christ, so numerous and striking as they were, to be explained? The testimony of the Baptist was not accompanied by signs as the people said of him on one occasion, John did no miracle, his service differing in this respect from that of the Messiah. But the superstitious king had an explanation satisfactory to himself, an explanation which his own terrified conscience supplied. John in the flesh wrought no miracles, but John returned from the grave must be, and was, full of supernatural energy. Herod said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore do these powers work in him. And yet though this wicked ruler professed to believe there was a messenger from the dead in the land he did not repent, and he is, therefore, a solemn example of the truth of Father Abraham's words in our Lord's parable A. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead, Luke 16 verses 30 and 31. Popular opinion said of the Lord that he was Elijah, the promised prophet, Malachi 4 verse 5, or one of God's prophetic messengers. There was no unanimity in the estimates of the public, as the apostles also stated in their reply to the Lord's question concerning current opinions, Matthew 16 verse 14 Mark 8 verse 28, Luke 9 verse 19. Herod, however, had personal reasons for his own theory. It was he who beheaded John. And he now believed that John lived again in the prophet of Galilee. There was some substratum of truth in Herod's opinion, though he was unconscious of it. He was wrong as to the identity of the person who was preaching the kingdom of God, but he was right in that John's testimony of truth and holiness was still being declared. He had removed the head of the Baptist, but the voice that spoke of righteousness and purity was not silenced. The witnesser for the truth may be slain, and his gory head displayed in the orgies of the wicked, but truth itself is not put to death by the sword. And Herod was not mistaken in thinking that the voice then preaching in Capernaum and Chorazin was saying to him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. 
it is well to note that the gospel history here becomes retrospective. Mark, in the early part of the book, mentions the imprisonment of John in connection with the commencement of the ministry of Jesus, 1 verse 14, but makes no further mention of the Baptist until now, when he turns back to narrate his violent end. John was truly the forerunner of the Messiah the righteous servant of Jehovah, to the very last act of his public testimony. He witnessed to the anointed sufferer not less in the prison than in the wilderness for both he and his master were cut off in the midst of their days. Peter and others followed the Lord to a martyr's end, but John had the unique privilege of immediately preceding him. The Jews under the power of Daniel's fourth empire. The historical references here to the death of John the Baptist by Herod, bring in the subject of the civil government of the Holy Land at the time of our Lord. The people and country were tributary to Rome, that western power which had then but recently assumed absolute supremacy in the political world. This subjection was not a surprise to those in Israel who had drunk of the spirit of prophecy. The Roman Empire was prefigured in the image vision of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 2, the iron government being the fourth in order of succession of the Gentile empires there portrayed. Daniel also saw it in prophetic vision under the figure of the fourth beast, terrible and powerful with great iron teeth, Daniel 7 verse 7. In the New Testament history, we find this iron rule in exercise at the time of the birth of Christ. Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all the world should be taxed, or enrolled, Luke 2 verse 1. In obedience to this edict Joseph and Mary, lineal descendants of the royal line of David, went up submissively from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea. The position of servitude in which the chosen people stood to the great empire is further shown by the circulation in their midst of the Roman currency in which they paid taxes to their overlords, Luke 20 verses 19 to 26. Again, the supremacy of the Roman government in the land of Israel was demonstrated by their exclusive exercise of the function of condemning prisoners to the extreme penalty. After the flood, the authority of man in government to punish the murderer by death, previously reserved by God, was conferred by him upon Noah and his descendants. God decreed that whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man, shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man, Genesis 9 verse 6. This power was recognized and in use throughout the successive forms of government in Israel, and after Israel's subjugation, it was exercised by the Gentile empires. For instance, Daniel testified of Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, that all peoples, nations, and languages, trembled and feared before him whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive, Daniel 5 verse 19. And the Roman emperors, though not so absolute in their rule as their Babylonian predecessors, reserved to themselves and to their local representatives the right of judicial execution. The Jews admitted to Pilate their lack of this authority, it is not lawful, they said, for us to put any man to death, John 18 verse 31. This authority was in the hands of the Roman governor who arrogantly and insolently said to his just and holy prisoner, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power authority to crucify thee, and have power authority to release thee? John 19 verse 10. This authority of Pilate Jesus did not deny but rather trace that authority to its true source, not to his imperial master at Rome but to the sovereign ruler of all, thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above, compare Romans 13 verses 1 to 4. Never was this judicial authority more flagrantly abused than it was by Pilate, the representative of the Roman Empire. Weakly submitting to the will of the Jews, he freed Barabbas the malefactor whom he should have executed for murder and condemned Jesus the benefactor to be crucified. The Herodian Rule The rule of the Herods was subservient to Rome. Several members of the Herod family are mentioned in the New Testament history, but most were enemies to Christ and to those who bore his name. 1. Herod the Great, one of the worst tyrants of all time, massacred the children of Bethlehem, Matthew 2 verse 16. 2. Archelaus was the son of Herod the Great whom Joseph feared, Matthew 2 verse 22. 3. Herod Antipas executed John the Baptist, Matthew 14 verses 1 to 12, and mocked Jesus, Luke 23 verse 11. 4. 
Herod Agrippa I executed James, the brother of John, Acts 12 verses 1 and 2. 5. Herod Agrippa II. Had Paul brought before him as prisoner, Acts 25 verses 13 to 27. The Herods were Edomian in origin and were placed in the position of titular rulers in Judea and Galilee by the Roman government. The name Edomia is the Greek equivalent of Edom, the land of the descendants of Esau. So that the position of the Jews in the days of the Gospels was humiliating in the extreme. They were not only under the dominion of the Gentile power at Rome, but a son of Esau ruled over them in the land. This order was not according to the purpose of God announced from the beginning, that, of Jacob and his brother, the elder should serve the younger, Genesis 25 verse 23. But through the unfaithfulness of the chosen people, this divine order was for the time reversed, and Esau was in the ascendant, though an enemy of God and his truth. Indeed hatred and jealousy and bitter animosity against God and the people of God characterize the Edomites throughout the Old Testament records. The last of the prophetic burdens declares them to be the people against whom Jehovah has indignation forever, Malachi 1 verse 4. And the New Testament opens with the effort of the Edomite, who was ruler of Edom as well as of Judea and Galilee, to destroy him who was born king of the Jews, Matt 2. The bloodthirsty Herod was a true descendant of Dog the Edomite, the murderer of the priests at Nob, 1 Samuel 22 verses 9 to 19. Herod Antipas and John. Herod Antipas, see note, son of Herod the Great, was tetrarch of Galilee, the northern part of his father's dominions, when John the Baptist came into the country round about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins and the immediate coming of the Messiah. Luke 3 verses 1 to 3. This voice crying in the wilderness resounded in the palace of the king. John spoke of an anointed one whose coming was imminent, and Herod may have feared in him, who was announced to appear, a possible rival to his throne, the tenure of which was so notoriously frail. He could hardly have entirely forgotten the incident which happened less than thirty years before when there came eastern magi to his father's court in Jerusalem, seeking him who was born king of the Jews. He may also have remembered, amongst other of his father's deeds of blood and cruelty, the horrible slaughter of the babes of Bethlehem perpetrated to ensure the death of the royal child. We think it must have been so, for conscience stimulates the most sluggish memory, and Antipas was riot altogether dead to conscience. Note. Antipas was the son of Herod by Maltes a Samaritan, so that he had not, in Jewish eyes, the slight redeeming feature of his brother Archelaus who was by a Jewish mother. End of note. Moreover, that conscience was appealed to by the dauntless testimony of the Baptist. For John came in the way of righteousness. Like Noah, he was a preacher of righteousness in a day of unnatural corruption. Like also his prototype Elijah, he delivered his words of truth in a profligate court. John reproved the king for the many notorious evils he had committed, but perhaps his blackest crime was to marry his brother Philip's wife, and the intrepid prophet did not shrink to denounce the incestuous adulterer to his face, although he sat upon a throne, condemning him by the laws of God and man, Leviticus 18 verse 16, Leviticus 20 verse 21. It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife summed up his charge. The king's guilt was trebly great, for the wife of Herod was alive, the husband of Herodias was alive, and Herod and Herodias stood in the relationship of uncle and niece. But there was no repentance. The words of John did not turn this disobedient one to the wisdom of the just, Luke 1 verse 17. Herod hardened his heart, and as the Spirit of God says, in view no doubt of the ancient precept, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm, that he added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison, and would have done worse to him, but when he would have put him to death he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet, Matthew 14 verse 5. This popular opinion in favor of John was so strong that the chief priests and elders also feared to oppose it, Matthew 21 verse 26. Herod's fear of John. The king was of a weak and vacillating nature, but not without a susceptibility to influences for good. We read that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous man and a holy, and kept him safe. 
and when he heard him, he was much perplexed, and he heard him gladly. The invincible nature of truth and righteousness is exemplified in the king's attitude toward the Baptist. It was Herod, not John, who feared. The empurpled voluptuary was a moral coward in the presence of the prophet, as such must be before the righteous and the holy. The licentious monarch had abandoned himself to the luxurious gratification of his every evil passion, for which the manners of his court gave him every facility. In contrast with this royal self-indulgence, John had learned the difficult lesson of self-denial and self-conquest in the solitudes of the wilderness. His hairy garment and his frugal diet were outward indications of the moral attitude of the man who by severe self-discipline, qualified himself, so far as man may do so, for his dignified mission. John, who called the people to sackcloth and ashes, was not a man clothed in soft raiment himself. He came neither eating nor drinking, for it was a day of fasting, and a day for men to afflict their souls. His practice corresponded with his preaching. The divine object, announced in the song of his father Zacharias, was that the people of Israel might serve God in holiness and righteousness all their days. And accordingly, the forerunner of the Messiah was a righteous and a holy man himself, and this character of John was so well known and well established that even the evil and suspicious king knew it, and feared him in consequence. Nevertheless, in spite of this admission, the unrighteous and unholy ruler did not release his righteous and holy prisoner but held him in custody. Yet this attitude was no strange event in the world's history, for evil's enmity of the good it sees in another has repeated itself from the beginning. Why did Cain slay Abel? Because his own works were evil, and like Herod, he knew that his brothers were righteous, 1 John 3 verse 12. It was so also in the history of Israel when their Messiah came. He whom they denied, and delivered over to Pilate for crucifixion, was preeminently the Holy and the Righteous One, Acts 3 verse 14, concerning whom even the crucified robber testified, He has done nothing amiss. And is it not the constant experience of those who are the possessors of the kingdom that they are persecuted for righteousness sake? Matthew 5 verse 10, 1 Peter 3 verses 10 to 14. It is true that the followers of Christ are called to a higher standard of suffering testimony, viz., that which arises out of a confession of the name of Christ, but this highest standard cannot be truly attained unless it is based upon righteousness and holiness of truth, the twin principles of the new creation, Ephesians 4 verse 24. Herod then feared John, if not as a prophet of God as a righteous and holy man, and kept him safe, see note, from the malice of his paramour Herodias who sought to kill him. And during the Baptist's imprisonment, Herod appears to have summoned his prisoner before him on several occasions, and the faithful words and fearless bearing of the prophet were not without their effect upon the profligate king. When he heard him, he was perplexed, or as many read it, he did many things. He sought to compromise with the truth by carrying out some minor reforms. But of the foul sin of which he was guilty before the eyes of his kingdom and before the eyes of his God, he was impenitent. He did many things, but not the one thing. He heard John gladly too, and it is also said elsewhere, that the common people heard Jesus gladly, Mark 12 verse 37. But such gladness is not associated with the hearing by which faith comes. Note. The word so translated may bear the sense of observing him diligently, or being regardful of him. But on the whole, the above rendering seems more in keeping with the context, as Trench points out. See also the note on the verse in J.N.D.S. translation. End of note.